Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Lockdown Dialogues from the Danube Institute uh, here in Budapest. My name is John O'Sullivan, I'm the president of the Danube Institute and I'm delighted to welcome our guest today. Uh, M Melanie Phillips is a British journalist, an author and a public commentator. She began her career writing for The Guardian and for New Society. During the 1990s, as a writer, she became more identified with the ideas of conservatism and the right. Um, she currently writes for The Times, The Jewish Chronicle, and The Jewish News Syndicate. Um, she covers political and social issues from a socially conservative perspective. She's also appeared as a panelist on the BBC Four programme, The Moral Maze, um, BBC One's Question Time, and among many awards, she was awarded the Orwell Prize for Journalism in 1996 while she was writing for The Observer. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, uh, Melanie, um, you joined The Guardian in 1977. Uh, you were a young um, left-wing uh, woman, well-educated from Ox Oxford, a member of the political class, though we didn't use the term in those days, uh, at least in, in training. And um, I wondered what it was like for you as this young progressive woman joining The Guardian in 1977, because The Guardian was, in fact, the Vatican of the progressive worldview in Britain. Well, I thought I was actually in heaven uh, at The Guardian. Um, it was a bit like being at Oxford again. Uh, it was a bit like being in the junior common room at Oxford. Um, uh, everybody was so incredibly intelligent and everybody was so nice. And they all seem to be, uh, we all seem to be singing from the same hymn sheet. I felt as if I was among people who felt like me. We all believed in truth as opposed to lies, in standing up for the oppressed and the vulnerable, in speaking truth to power, in uh, fighting uh, oppressive uh, people and regimes, in fighting nasty things, in helping to create a better world. Um, and. I was so thrilled to be amongst such people. I felt rather overawed, to put it mildly. Um, but I was very happy uh, for several years, um, and it gradually fell apart. Um, I notice in your Wikipedia entry that you wrote a play at Traitors, and even more remarkably, a play that was then performed. It was about journalistic, eth journalistic ethics uh, in relation to, I think, the Lebanese Civil War and the Falklands. It was well reviewed by the Sunday Times reviewer, but I think you said elsewhere it did not get favorable reviews. But given the topic, ethics and journalism, and given that it was, I think this was in the mid 80s, um, was that topic chosen um, and did, because you were having to reflect on such questions uh, in, in The Guardian at the time? In other words, um, were you beginning to be somewhat disenchanted? The play that I wrote, Traitors, uh, arose directly from a really quite a shattering experience of The Guardian, which changed my life and set me on the path to infamy, as it were, uh, away from uh, the hallowed uh, halls of the progressive left. What happened was in 1982, um, I was a different kind of person then. I'd never been to Israel, was very uninterested in Israel um, for various reasons we can go into on another occasion. But in 1982, Israel had invaded the Lebanon in order to root out the Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, which was using Lebanon as a base to conduct terrorism against Israel. And, I wasn't particularly interested in this, but I understood that it was a defensive war and that they'd gone in too far, too fast. It was somehow they got themselves into a mess. Anyway, um, what really troubled me was that on the progressive left, this uh, uh, adventure by Israel, this, 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 this war in which they got in too deep, um, was presented as if they were the aggressor. Uh, there was no mention that it was a defensive war. They were presented as if they were wanton killers. And that was bad enough, but also what came out of the woodwork simultaneously with this presentation of Israel uh, was sheer unadulterated anti-Semitism against Jews in Britain. So we were all regarded as basically the same. We were all a clan. We were all basically the same kind of people. And we would all basically support Israel and we would support child killers and that kind of thing. And I was very put out by this. 
And I was very disturbed by this, and I was very put out by the behavior of The Guardian, because it seemed to me The Guardian was disproportionately concentrating on Israel. At the same kind of time uh, that this war was going on in Lebanon, um, uh, there was an atrocity, uh, a big atrocity, uh, in Syria. Uh, president Assad, the father of the current President Assad, uh, presided over a, a massacre of many thousands of his uh, opponents over a period of a couple of weeks. And this was regarded, this was treated in The Guardian as uh, just another foreign story. Whereas if the Israelis killed any Palestinian in Lebanon, this was a front page story, outrage op-eds, outrage editorials and so on. So in all innocence, I asked my colleagues, I was then a Guardian editorial writer, a leader writer, and I asked my colleagues one day in a leader conference, we seem to have a double standard, why is this? And they looked at me as if I crossed a line. And I didn't know what the line was that I crossed mm -hmm. or why, but I knew that immediately I was on one side of the line and they were all on the other side. And they said to me, of course we have a double standard. After all, we in the West are brought up to believe in things like the sanctity of life and human rights. In the developing world, they're not brought up to believe any of that. So we can't judge them by our standards of sanctity of life and human rights. That would be racism. And I said, what are you saying? That if somebody is unfortunate enough to be born into the developing world, they don't have the same rights to life and liberty that we have? In my book, that's racism. And then they said, why are you so upset? We do you the great honor. I became you. I thought I was we. I became you. We do you the great honor of believing as the state of Israel believes. So as I become you and the state of Israel. We become the same thing. We do you the great honor of believing that you believe like us in sanctity of life and human rights. Uh, so we judge you, i.e. the state of Israel, to which I'd never been, by our standards. And what's more, they said, you tell us that you are morally superior to us. I've never said such a thing, and the Jewish people never say such a thing. But you tell us you're morally superior to us, so we judge you by higher mm -hmm. standards. And at that point, it was as if a door had slammed in my head, and I thought, oh my goodness. I thought we were all on the same side against racism, against anti-Semitism, against lies, against prejudice, but they are on the other side. So that was one shattering experience. And then no less shattering was an encounter I had with the then chief leader writer, uh, who was a delightful man, the best of Britain, kind, intelligent, funny, I really liked him, shy. And there was a period in which the Lebanon war was going on and the Falklands war was going on. It was a very short period which they were both going on. And at the Guardian, we were consumed by the Falkland war, or the Falklands war. You know, there was this tremendous row whether Mrs. Thatcher was right or wrong. Was she mad to go to war over a load of sheep? Was she right because these sheep were British sheep? I mean, you can imagine. We thought about nothing else while this Falklands War was going on. And this chief leader writer one day met me and said, oh, Melanie, what are we going to say about your war? Your war. He did not mean the Falklands War. He meant the war in the Lebanon. I had never been to Israel. I had never written about Israel. But because I was a Jew and had spoken up for truth about Israel, the Lebanon War was my war. I was no longer properly British. Now, these were shattering experiences to me. And around that time, I happened to meet someone who became a dear friend, a woman called Julia Pascal, who was a theatre director. And I was talking to her about all this. And out of that conversation, I wrote the play called Traitors. And Julia put it on at a fringe theatre. It was actually a lesbian theatre, would you believe? And they were magnificent. And a lot of my colleagues at The Guardian came to the, see this play. And afterwards, some of them said to me, 
what kind of people would have said this kind of thing to you? <laughs> and it was them. They themselves. <laughs> so this was a shattering experience to me. It made me realize a number of things about the left that I could no longer trust their moral compass, that their moral compass was basically warped in some terrible way. I could no longer trust their position on anything. And so I became very wary, but it took a very long time before I was able to really um, uh, decide that I was no longer part of them because they were a bit like a family. And it's a bit like, you know, when a family abuses you, you don't want to believe they're abusing you. And then, you know, after a while, uh, you can't avoid the fact that they are abusing you. You know, I recognize the truth of everything you've just said, but I do so, in a sense, um, across a gulf, um, through a glass darkly, so to speak, because, of course, I don't recognize this as being typical of British opinion as a whole during the period we're talking about. Um, it seems to me, for example, I was in exactly the same position as you on the other side. I was a young leader, well, moderately young reader writer on the Telegraph and a sketch writer. And during things like the Entebbe raid and, and later events in, in the Middle East, the sympathy of our writers and readers was not universally, but overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Now, of course, is Israel is a power like any others. It will occasionally do wrong things. You will get criticism. But I don't recognize this hostility um, to Israel. I recognize in, in, I, I, what I describe as a kind of a, a sympathy, um, which uh, w was the sympathy of a power which had had to deal with difficult situations and saw Israel in the same light. Uh, yes, I mean, things like the Entebbe raid, certainly uh, Israel was, you know, heroic, uh, was, was, was regarded as absolutely heroic. And, you know, people were astounded by its daring do and its, its, its abilities and so on. That's all true. But what I'm describing is attitudes on the left um, uh, at that time mm. in the 1980s, in, in 1982. And it was on the left that, you know, Ariel Sharon was called a Nazi. Now, you know, if you call a Jew a Nazi, that in my book is anti-Semitism. And there was a tremendous amount of that going on. And there was also a tremendous amount of um, ally to that, of talk about... Um, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet, you know, more, es more old Estonians than Etonians. Mm -hmm. A lot of the way in which Michael Howard was framed uh, in public discourse uh, when he was uh, leader of the party was to do with uh, the fact that he was so Jewish. Um, uh, we were picking all that up. When I say we, people like me and my uh, friend Julia Pascal um, and others who were so concerned about this, we were picking all that up. Now, um, People who weren't in those circles probably wouldn't even have noticed it. But in my view, it all went underground for various reasons uh, for quite a long time. But it festered and it came out, I think, in the year 2000, uh, when, Israel, when Israelis were being blown to bits in pizza parlors and discotheques and buses. Um, and uh, immediately uh, that they uh, tried to stop this. They went into the disputed territories, what people call the West Bank, in order to root out this terrible thing that was happening. Um, and immediately in Britain, uh, they were represented as Nazis again. Um, and out of that experience, that experience really did finally change my life. And, and change it but you had already at this point left the guardian so um, what was the in what sense did that change your life that you you became you changed your views in what respects well it changed my views as a british jew um a, a number of us at that stage realized uh when we it was a sort of fairly common commonly held exp, um, a, a view at that stage in the in the year 2000 or the year 2000 2001 mm. Um, that we had, as a community, the British Jewish community, been living in a fool's paradise. We'd had a kind of 50-year moratorium on anti-Semitism, from the discovery of the concentration camps, the extermination camps, to now, to then, to the year 2000. During which period, um, anti-Semitism went underground. It was considered, uh, you know, you were a social pariah. 
if you were horrible about Jewish people. And now it was open season again. And it wasn't just um, the sort of saloon bar anti-Semitism of, you know, uh, uh, the sort of uh, oh, oh. caricatures and so on. I mean, uh, there was a seminal moment again for me and for the community. I think it was, uh, it was uh, the, the end of 2000, I think it was. I was on Question Time, BBC TV's Question Time. Uh, which is a panel discussion before a live audience in different cities every week. And we were in, I think it was Bristol or Gloucester, somewhere very well healed, somewhere very sort mm. of upper class, intelligent. Mm. And I was accused on TV of having dual loyalty. At that stage, I'd been to Israel once to see my daughter who had come to Israel. Um, dual loyalty because I had stuck up for Israel and that's what we found. Any British Jew who stuck up for Israel was accused of dual loyalty and the dual loyalty is an anti-Semitic canard going back centuries, long before there was ever a state of Israel to have a loyalty to. Um, mm. Jews have always been considered to be, uh, by anti-Semites, to be disloyal to the country they're living in. And it was that that came out so so terribly in the year 2000. And when I say it changed me, what it did was I realized that as a Brit, well, I came to the conclusion as a British Jew, it was over. The idea that we were happily secure in Britain, that was the best place for us to be, was over. It was a fool's paradise. I also realized how ignorant I had been until that point of Jewish history in the Middle East, of the history of Israel, of who was right and who was wrong, to the, the extent to which the lie that was being told about Israel was so profoundly evil and so much worse and so different from the kind of way in which any other people or country or cause was ever talked about. I realized I was ignorant of Jewish history. I realized I was ignorant of Judaism. I realized a lot of things. And I realized that um, I just didn't feel comfortable in Britain anymore. And a few years after that, uh, we bought a place in Israel, uh, where I'm speaking to you from now. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm between two worlds. Uh, I'm British. Uh, I'm not Israeli. I will never be Israeli culturally. Mm. Um, but in many respects, and this sounds bizarre because Israel is possibly one of the most dangerous places for any human being to be in the world, being the flashpoint that it is. You know, down the road, there are people with knives and guns trying to kill people like me uh, across, a, across a border not many miles away uh, is uh, Iran, uh, which uh, every day, more or less, uh, commits itself to committing genocide against the Jews of Israel and wiping it off the face of the earth. Uh, Israel is surrounded by enemies. And yet, I feel more safe here than I do in Britain. I don't mean physically safe. I mean psychically safe. Nobody here, nobody here is ever going to say, I don't belong. And that was a shattering realization that in Britain I could no longer trust that, that to be the case. I'm not going to contest what you've just said, and I can't do so, because the recent history of anti-Semitism in Britain in the last few years has been very clear and marked. It has also, of course, produced a reaction against it. And I would have to say I feel terribly sad and regretful that you should be able to make this case, if you see what I mean. Um, the, um, and because I always felt that um, actually Jews and other people, everybody, was safe in England, and, um, and I, want, I want that to, to be re-established, so to speak. I want my confidence to be re-established. But let me therefore turn to your diagnosis of our current ills, uh, because in, in view of what you've said, I think it's fair and important to describe you as an English patriot. Um, and I want to say, uh, therefore, why is that? And why is the description English patriot such a controversial thing to be? Well, because to answer your last question first, uh, English patriot is identified with being an English nationalist. Patriotism has become viewed as synonymous with nationalism. And nationalism has become synonymous with racism and xenophobia 
and fascism. Um, if Britain in 1940 hadn't been deeply patriotic, hadn't had then an idea of itself as a nation that it valued above everything else, that for which it was literally prepared to die because it believed in itself as a nation committed to great values that it believed to be worth living and dying for. If it hadn't believed that, if it hadn't been patriotic, it would never have stood alone against Hitler. Um, and so this idea that, you know, the nation state is somehow the, uh, 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 far from being the, the, the guarantor of liberty, is inimical to all decent values, is, I'm afraid, the, one of the fundamental uh, ways in which the progressive left have warped discourse uh, over many decades. Um, and I would say it goes back to uh, the Second World War. I would say that the Second World War and the Holocaust in Europe, in my view, dealt a shattering blow to the belief that Europe had previously had in itself, and indeed that the West had previously had in itself, as being the crucible of all good things. Because look, this terrible thing, the Holocaust, had not happened in some benighted backwater of the world. It had happened in the very crucible, the apex of Western civilization and high culture. And so therefore there must be something wrong with Western civilization and high culture. And there must be something wrong with the nation because of course Hitler had believed in Germany as the nation. Well, in my view, that's a misreading of Hitler and it's a misreading of fascism. Hitler, you could say, was a nationalist, but he was much more than a nationalist. He believed in, uh, he, he was an imperialist. He wanted to take over other people's countries. He believed that he was the reincarnation, or he would bring about the reincarnation of the Holy Roman Empire. If you're faced with imperialism, to be a nation state is the only real defense against that. However, the two things became kind of synonymous. And as a result, um, I think the West became deeply, deeply, deeply demoralized. It decided that it really hadn't got a leg to stand on culturally. And so it became, I think, very vulnerable in its uh, intelligentsia, in, its, uh, in the people who ran its, its political uh, class and its cultural, its cultural class. Um, it became very vulnerable to ideas which had always said we want to basically uh, redo the Western world. The Western world is capitalist. It has to be overthrown. And so what we've lived through over the last several decades is what's been called the long march through the institutions, which has basically sought to take over from within British society and turn it inside out. And one of the things it's turned inside out, well, Many of the things it's turned inside out, uh, they are basically British and Western uh, values, the whole moral uh, basis of the West based in, in the Bible. Um, that whole biblical morality has been replaced by man-made ideologies, which have sacrificed truth to power. And one of the things it sacrificed is this idea of the nation state. Uh, that the nation state became associated with nationalism, which became associated with fascism. And consequently, uh, the perfect society could only be achieved by transnationalism, by breaking down all these borders and boundaries. So, and that you, could, you couldn't have any kind of hierarchy of values. So at the, the domestic level, uh, we have moral and cultural relativism. What is right for me is what is right. There's no such thing as objective truth. Can I just interrupt at this point to say, I want to get on to those very important points in a moment. But before we leave uh, the nation state question narrowly, I can perfectly well see why that are, the arguments you've made relate to countries like Germany itself, the countries which succumbed to fascism or which were conquered by Germany and were then ambiguously related to what happened. But I can't see why the British should interpret uh, the Holocaust and the Second World War in that way, or the Australians, or the Canadians, or the Americans. They, after all, 
did stand against it and they did of course eventually defeat it. I think that it uh, was uh, uh, as a result of the uh, uh, kind of demoralization, general demoralization of the West because of the Holocaust. Now you could say that Britain fought against Hitler, um, but uh, uh, that's not quite the point. Uh, Britain came out of the Second World War uh, having won it. Um, uh, in a very bad way. It was bankrupt, it was in hock to, uh, to uh, America, um, and uh, it was in the process of losing its empire. And you know the old uh, saying, losing an empire and never finding a role. I think that is exactly what happened to Britain. And then you have the great humiliation of the Suez fiasco in 1956, and I think that the British ruling elite became completely demoralized mm. and consequently lost faith in itself uh, in, in, in Britain as a nation. They came to believe that Britain could never go it alone again, that it was finished. And that's why I think over the year, over you know, several years later, uh, Britain joined the precursor to the European Union because it felt it couldn't, it, it couldn't, it couldn't uh, uh, exist without some block behind it. And I think its ruling elite, its, intellect, its, its intelligentsia, became very vulnerable to all these ideas, which basically were, 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 were all founded on the, on the fundamental belief that there was something terribly wrong about the nation state. And you say that this extended also to the conservative elite, and I think that that is to a considerable extent true. It doesn't account for someone like Margaret Thatcher entirely. And there are others like, for example, Michael Howard, Ian Duncan Smith, and I'd uh, say my friend Lorman Lamont, for example, who, who continued not to, uh, uh, not to embrace this pessimistic view of, uh, the, of our own society and our own, in a sense, destiny. Um, so um, I'm asking, therefore, what, what was it that preserved some in the elite? And I would say, I think you agree with this, the vast mass of ordinary Brits from succumbing to the same set of ideas, uh, the same national self-hatred? Yes, I mean, this is obviously a rather complicated uh, picture to, uh, to, to, to try to paint in a very short space of time. So what I say is necessarily inadequate from that point of view. I, I wouldn't say that the Conservative Party in Britain was consumed by national self-hatred at all. For the reasons that you say, but I do think that conservative, conservatism generally and the Conservative Party in Britain in particular have basically lost their way. And I kind of saw it happen, I thought, uh, when communism fell. Now, communism falling what took a, actually a, was much, a much more protracted process than simply the fall of the Berlin Wall. But it seemed to me at the time that when uh, communism fell, uh, conservative ranks uh, said to themselves broadly, well, what do we do now for an encore? Uh, we've kind of spent the last century fighting this terrible thing, this scourge of communism, and now it's gone. So now what do we do? Uh, have we won? And there was a sense in which um, people thought that because the post-communist world embraced the free market, that it was kind of all over. And I remember at the time, conservatives saying to themselves, uh, what do we do now? You know, on what do we hang our hat? And I remember people saying, well, it's got to be liberty. This is the banner that we fight behind, liberty. And I thought, oh my goodness, they've lost it. They've completely lost it. Because that was the banner that was the banner of the left, liberty, freedom. I am free to do what I want and no one's going to tell me otherwise. So what the left did in the social sphere what I believe is right is right. What I believe is right for me is what is right. It was the takeover of the objective by the subjective was reflected by the cons in the conservative ranks in the economic sphere. The free market would actually solve all problems. And I thought this was completely wrong because what had been lost was the idea of community and moral responsibility. And because the conservative ranks broadly I'm speaking generally, obviously, but broadly, hung their hat on this uh, chimera of liberty um, without realizing that it had to be encased in something else called, I would call, moral responsibility. Um, the conservative ranks didn't realize the extent to which the culture war was undermining the whole framework on which the whole 
edifice of liberty depends, which is basically biblical morality. And, uh, you know, the idea that a community is based on moral responsibility, on putting chains on our appetites and all those kinds of things. And so when faced with the culture war, the conservative ranks didn't realize what they were up against. It took Mrs. Thatcher a very long time to realize something was going badly wrong with education. Um, and not only did they not realize in time, but then they didn't realize the extent to which um, the people, or not the people, but, 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 but the, the, the kind of established mores of society uh, were, uh, were being changed for the worse. So they, they took the view, well, well, this is progress. This is how people change. We can't stand against change. We can't be Canute holding back the tide. We have to move with the times. And so the conservative ranks, not realizing what was going on fully, just went along with a lot of it. And consequently, there was no fight back. Um, and I, 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 you say I'm, you know, I was an English uh, uh, patriot. And indeed, I do consider myself in that way uh, because I watched all this happen. I watched the, the education system turn against uh, the transmission of the culture down through the generations. That's what an education system is. That's what education is. And I remember sitting through all these debates in the 19, uh, late 80s and in the 90s in which uh, the people who, uh, you know, the professors of education and historians all sat around saying, that's terrible because our culture is fundamentally racist and colonialist and capitalist and exploitative and imperialist. We can't teach that. We have to take the his take our, our history and junk it and replace it by uh, the experiences of the people who are who are who we are dealing with, and I I watched this happen. I watched the conservative ranks not realise it was happening, and it didn't just happen in 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 the education uh, system in regard to the teaching of history, although that was a very important aspect of it, but it involved. The, the steady erosion of all the kind of uh, uh, informal laws and stigmas and moral frameworks that had kept the show on the road hitherto. Mm. And I watched as conservatives just went down like nine pins uh, in the face of all this and are still going down like nine pins oh. on the basis that we can't stand against it, it's simply how society changes. But hasn't there been a rebellion against exactly this, which we call Brexit, but which may be wider than Brexit? Because I notice, for instance, that Robert Toombs recently produced a very fine and largely patriotic history of the English people. And I notice that he and other historians and other economists have banded together to make a broader case for Brexit than the one you will inevitably will get from politicians. So that I have a sense that there may be a, a wider um, rediscovery of the English genius, to, put, to use a term now never used. Well, you know, Britain has always been saved by its ordinary people, not the intelligentsia. Uh, it's always been saved by the common sense and practical, uh, practical morality and decency. Uh, of the ordinary uh, British people, the working class, if you like to call them that. And that's what happened in Brexit. I mean, uh, you know, I I've been writing along the lines I've been talking about uh, for the best part of two decades before Brexit. It had caused me to uh, sever my relations with the left, which regarded me as having become the right. I didn't regard myself as having become the right. I still held to all the values that I had originally started with. I just had decided that the people I thought were on my side were on the other side. But all the time I was writing about these things, you know, uh, education, uh, multiculturalism, um, uh, Islamic uh, supremacism, and all kinds of other uh, uh, issues um, on which I had been embattled from, the, you know, to, 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 a, to, a, to, to a degree against it would seem the entire world because all the people who command the culture were against me. Uh, that's, uh, during those, those years, I was buoyed by the tremendous support I had from ordinary people who could see what I was seeing. Mm. 
And I thought, you know, it, it, it's really what kept me going that I just thought, gosh, it would seem that there are millions of people out there who think like me, but don't have a voice. And they would say to me, write to me, and they would say to me, you've got to keep going because only when we hear and see you do we realize that we're not alone in thinking this. So, and then Brexit happened. And I woke up on Brexit day and I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> there they are, all those people all those millions of people who've been supporting me, they've done it. They voted for Brexit. And you know, that was my first thought. My first thought was, my goodness me, they've done it. And now there is a chance that Britain can rediscover itself, can rediscover its greatness, can rediscover its own belief in itself and its own values and its own traditions and reassert them. There is now a chance that Britain could be saved. That was my first thought. You know what my second thought was? My second thought was, it's never going to happen because the intelligentsia will throw everything they possibly can against this to make sure it doesn't happen. And then we had this terrible fight. And in a way, that culture war is still very much going on, but I quite agree with you. Uh, Brexit was the moment in which the ordinary people uh, came forward, came through and reasserted themselves and showed that whatever the intelligentsia and the political class and the elites have said over all these years, there is a level at which ordinary people have such innate common sense. And because they're so connected to reality and to the reality of their local neighborhoods, their whole framework of values uh, and their ability to understand the truth uh, is so much superior uh, to everything that we read in uh, our culture.